right, hello, 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 City First Church. Man, I'm so glad that you're here. If you're joining us in person or online, I'm just happy that you are with us. And if it's your first time, I want you to know that you are a part of the family already. We are glad that you are here. Put your hands together for our first time guests. Come on, love you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to take a moment and start off by recognizing some very amazing individuals, the City First Leadership College students. Come on, give a round of applause as they come up on stage. Yeah. Today is their graduation. And we are so, so appreciative of each and every one of them. What a good looking group of people. All right. All right, well, listen, you may go ahead and have a seat, and they're going to stay up here a moment. I want to take a moment before I begin my message, and I just want to, on behalf of Jen and myself and the entire uh, staff here, as well as the board at City First Church, we want to recognize these amazing individuals. And tonight, we're going to have a big graduation for them. I'd let, invite all of you to show up at 6 p.m. Central Time, but... I want to take a moment in our services to recognize them, and here's the reason why. These individuals entered into our leadership college, and they wanted Jesus to change their life, and that is exactly what Jesus did, right? Right? Is that not true? And God has changed their life, but I want you guys to know that these individuals are amazing world changers who have a heart for the house of God. And they do so much for City First. Over the last year, they've invested so much behind the scenes, on the stage, all over, running various ministries. And in the process, they've been learning about God's house and the church and how it works. And God's been speaking to them. But I want you guys to know that we could not do this without them. And they are just such amazing individuals. And I want to have a quick word of prayer over them. And again, y'all come back tonight because we're going to really celebrate tonight all that Jesus has done. But let's just take a moment and as a church, let's pray over them and their future. Some of them are coming back for another year. They're coming back for a sophomore, junior, or senior year. Some of them are graduating and they're going off into ministry, off into the marketplace, off into life. So let's just pray over them God's blessing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every one of these students. Lord, I thank you that you handpicked them to be in this program, this ministry. Thank you that you directed them here. And Lord, I pray that now that you would bless them as we celebrate all that you did in their lives tonight, I pray that they would launch with purpose and with mission into the next season. Whether they're coming back or going on into the marketplace or ministry, go with them, surround them, protect them. Lord, what you've invested into them, I pray that that would be a seed that grows. And that, Lord, that they would become world changers for you. That the world would never be the same because of their lives. Lord, thank you for all of the countless hours that they've served your church. And God, I pray that you would just smile upon them. May they sense your affirmation and that your pleasure over them. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, one more time. Let's give them a huge round of applause. Love you guys. Love you guys very much. Any of you want to preach this message? Anybody? 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 Johnny? Johnny? No? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Well, listen, uh, very appreciative of them, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually, I started uh, the program back in 1993. It was called the Rockford Masters Commission at that point. It's gone through various iterations, and I would just say this, it is the best that it has ever been. Now that we are many, many decades later, uh, the Leadership College is strong, and I want to just take a second, and I want to just recognize also Pastor Lance and Pastor Beth that direct the Leadership College, and they done a phenomenal job along with all of the staff and the team that helped them. All right, well listen, today um, we are finishing up a series called Stranger Things and I'm talking about the power of who I am. The power of who I am. And I'll explain that in a moment, but you know what? It seems like our culture is really uh, pretty fixated on trying to figure out who we are. 
Like, like there's a lot of people asking the question, why am I here? Who am I? And, and, and here's the thing. Um, I believe that America is suffering from disassociative disorder. <laughs> and some of you are like, what does that mean? Well, what that means is, is this. It is the state of being disconnected from your sense of identity. Disassociative disorder is the state of being disconnected from your sense of identity. Youth nowadays are trying to figure out who they are. Adults, though, are also trying to figure out who they are. A lot of times adults have times in life where there maybe is a tragedy, maybe a crisis, maybe it's a divorce, maybe it's a midlife crisis, somewhere where all of a sudden they start asking questions, who am I? And we almost revert back to our, uh, our pre-teen and our teenage years, right? In fact, there are many buzzwords right now in our culture regarding this idea of finding your identity. Here's one of them, self-help. Self-help. Some of you are like, really? Yeah, well, again, I'm not saying self-help is all the way bad. But here's the thing, a lot of times people are trying to figure out, they're, they're, they're self-helping themselves to try to figure out their identity, and this is slightly deceiving, and here's the reason why, because if you could have helped yourself, you already would have by now. So there is a limitation to self-help when it comes to especially finding your identity. Here's another buzzword or a buzz sentence. Be true to yourself. I, I hear this all the time, especially on social media. Hashtag be true to yourself. Now for me to sit up here and to disagree with this statement, it would be kind of like cussing at the Pope. Because people would be highly offended if I were to stand up here and say, this idea is maybe a little flawed, but I'm going to risk it and I'm going to tell you that that idea is a little flawed. And here's the reason why. Basically, it means that to act in accordance with who you think you are. Who you think you are. Well, who I thought I was at age 18 is way different than who I think I am now in my early 50s. So here's the thing. When you, when you just identify with who you think you are, there's a large chance that you will be in error. Here's another buzzword, follow your heart. Follow your heart, oh man, I'll tell you what, it makes, gives you warm fuzzies in your tummy. I'm gonna follow my heart, it sounds adventurous. Man, I could do a podcast on this, I'm gonna follow my heart. Well, that's all great until you read the book of Jeremiah. Book of Jeremiah chapter 17 verse nine says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So if I follow my heart, I'm following the part of me that's most deceitful. <laughs> okay, so there's a limitation there, right? In his book, um, Authenticity Hoax, author Andrew Potter, he says this, he says, being true to yourself captures the fullness of our commitment in authenticity as a moral ideal. In other words, we have made this idea of authenticity and following your heart literally an ethic. Does that make sense? Which is why for me to stand up here, many people might disagree with what I'm going to say today because we've made this an ethic. It's like I'm going to follow my heart. I'm going to be true to myself. I'm the captain of my own ship. I mean, we think these things, and for me to come and say, well, let's question that a moment. Some people are going to immediately put up a wall and go, no, because we've made this an ethic. But here's the problem with being authentic. Sometimes it can become an excuse to live the way that you want rather than the way that you should. All right? Like, how about if I'm inherently selfish? Which, by the way, we all are. Some of you are like, I'm not selfish. Oh, listen, ask your mama or your daddy, okay? <laughs> the first words that came out of your mouth were not share, it was mine, okay? So we are inherently selfish. How about if I'm verbally abusive? How about if I'm a gossip? How about if I'm lazy or prideful or a workaholic? If I'm authentic to myself, then aren't I just saying, hey, listen, this is the way I am, deal with it. This is just who I am. See, that's where it becomes flawed. N.T. Wright, who's a theologian, he wrote this. He said, 
If you are true to yourself, you will end up a complete mess. The challenge is to take the self you find within and to choose wisely which impulses and desires to follow and which ones to resist. It's a very, very good statement there. Interestingly enough, I believe our society is more self-absorbed and obsessed about itself than maybe some historians believe any other culture in history. Now, some could argue the Roman culture could rival us, and maybe that's true. At best, we're catching up to the Romans. At worst, we've surpassed the Romans. In fact, around uh, 300 to 400 AD, right as Rome is beginning to decline, especially at the end of the 300s, they had 177 holidays in their annual calendar. That is one for every other day almost, where they could just relax and think about themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not Rome, but I will tell you this, that we as a culture, we are frantically searching and trying to find our true self, and yet the more we search, the more we come up empty-handed. And I believe Today, I want to talk about the fact that I think our culture is having an identity crisis. An identity crisis. Now, can I just make a disclaimer for a moment? I'm going to say things today that I know are going to maybe rock some of you, and maybe even some of you are going to feel a little offended by what I have to say. It's not that I don't love you. I just want to speak truth and not just make you feel good, okay? And, and, and I'm going to say some things that go counter culture. Okay, in fact, culture is going to say some of the exact opposite things that I'm going to say. But, but again, I believe we're all adults here. I, I, I also believe this. I also believe that you want truth, otherwise you wouldn't be here. All right? And, and I, I'm going to say some things that I'm not going to make it a real, like, motivational speech today. I'm going to, I'm going to really kind of dive deep in today. And, and I just believe that, that really, as humans, we are the only ones with the opportunity to have a coherent self. No other uh, animal, you could say, in God's creation, no other creature has the ability to have a coherent self other than humans. Like my dog, this is a picture of Rocky, all right? He is a German short-haired pointer. Um, we go hunting, upland hunting together. He's a great dog, very obedient. Um, the only one that listens to me in my house. And, uh, <laughs> but Rocky does not think to himself, who am I? He does not think, why do I exist? He does not think, what is my purpose? He's thinking about three things. He's thinking about, when do I eat again? Who's going to pay attention to me? And where's the softest place in the home to sleep all day? Kind of like a teenager, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. The difference, though, between Rocky and a teenager is this, is a teenager is thinking much higher things they're asking themselves this question, who am I really? What is my identity? You see, we tell our young people many times, and parents do this, we tell our young people, here's another buzz term, go find yourself. Like, go explore, go find yourself. And, and again, now if you said that as a parent, again, that doesn't mean you're bad, and, and, and none of us are perfect, all right? We've all said dumb things to our kids, all right? But I would say this, that that is really not a good statement because here, here's the reason why it's bad advice. How do you find yourself as a person? Like, how are you going to find yourself? Well, many times people, humans, find themselves by listening to the loudest voices in their lives telling them who they are. Well, how about if those voices are wrong? So if you just go find yourself... Maybe people are listening to the loudest voice in their life. Maybe the loudest voice is themselves. But how about if you're wrong? And by maybe finding yourself, maybe it means go experiment with different identities and figure out one that feels the best. It feels like it's right. Well, scientists say that your brain isn't even fully developed until age 25. And I'll tell you what felt good to me at age 13 is not what I know is truth now. <laughs> Can I tell you that? And so 
I, I think that, that instead of um, this exercise of finding ourselves, and we think this is an objective process, I think we need to embrace the reality that it's very subjective. Like you can find your hobbies, and you can find your dreams, and you can find your passions, but that's different than finding you and who you are. So go find yourself is kind of like going into the world without a map and saying, I'm going to find me by leading me. All right? No true north. I'm just going to find me by leading me. Well, here's the thought to consider when it comes to finding your identity, whether you're age 13 or 93, okay? It is this. I cannot know who I am without first being confident of what I am and to whom I belong. I really believe this as a truth. You see, what am I? What am I? Well, I'm a human being and so are you. And that's different from everything else in creation. You understand that human beings aren't at the same level as a tomato plant or a platypus, okay? Humans are different and this is why I believe that if you embrace evolutionism or Darwinism, that actually creates an identity crisis. And some of you are like, well, how is that? Because this is why. If you and I are just a product of billions of years of chance, and over time we just crawled out of the swamp, then guess what? We have no purpose. We just survived. And there's a better way of maybe even saying that. Maybe we don't see that we have a greater purpose or we even have an assigned purpose because if we believe in evolution or Darwinism, then guess what? There was no intentionality when it came to your formation. In fact, I would say this. Our current culture keeps on talking about that we're important and I'm special. And I believe, actually, that's true. I believe every person in this room and every person watching right now is important and special. I believe that because I believe in a creator. If there's no creator, then you're not special and you're not important. You see, because if you're just a product of evolutionary chance, then you're lying to yourself to believe that you're special. There's nothing special about you. You're lucky. You lived. There's no such thing as purpose because at the end of the day, you're just accidental. See, see how it creates an identity crisis? See, I believe we're more than just accidental and lucky. I believe that. I think we should ask ourselves a question. If we don't believe in a creator, then why do we try to pursue purpose? Why is purpose important if life is accidental? Why is purpose even important at all? You see, if we're just here by chance then we just survive and it's the survival of the fittest and those that can adapt the best, right? But if we're made by a creator, but if there is intelligent design, if there is what I would even say is divine design, then it's a whole different story. It's a whole different story. Then there's purpose then there's identity, then there is a reason for life. Do you see that? It says in Psalms, I love what the psalmist says when describing God, he says this, he says, when I look at the night sky, you ever looked into the stars and you're like, wow, this is amazing, especially if you're out in the country, like sometimes when you're in the city, you don't see it as much, but you're out in the country and there's so many stars, the galaxies, and, you, and see the works of your fingers, the psalmist says. The moon and the stars you set into place. What are mere mortals, in other words humans, that you should think about them? You know what that infers? That we have a creator that actually thinks about us. He thinks about us. He thinks about us 24-7, 365 days a year, every single minute, every single second. He's thinking about you. So he thinks, and then, listen, it goes on to say, human beings, that you should care for them. Do you know there's a God that cares for you? That, that it isn't just he thinks about you. He cares for you, which means love is involved. Yet you made them. So right there, the psalmist is saying, were created, there's a divine design, made them a little lower than God. In other words, he's saying God is supreme. Then God made the angels, and then he made humans. Like, we're important, in other words. So in our creation, importance was assigned to us. And it says, and crowned them with glory and honor. We're crowned. You know you're crowned with purpose. 
You're crowned with importance. You're crowned with significance. So that's why when you hear our society saying, I'm important, I'm special, I agree with that. You are crowned with importance. You're crowned as being special, but only if you understand that you were created by divine design. Do you understand that? It goes to say in Psalms chapter 139, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knitted me together. In other words, design, knitted me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Some of us are more complex than others, right? Nudge your neighbor, all right? Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. What am I? We need to know what I am. What am I? I'm a human. I'm a created being, the result of divine design and formed with divine love. I am known, I am purposed, I am noticed, and I am cared for. Come on, right? I am not just some highly intelligent animal at the end of a long evolutionary chain, accidentally here, full of luck, just surviving through this life. There are other things that build your identity, like your race. Do you know that you were born on purpose with the color skin that you have? Do you understand that? And there is no greater race than another, because God created them all, all the colors. Red and yellow, black and white, right? Remember the song, okay? And I will tell you that, that you know what? You were created with an ethnicity. You were even created in, in a nationality, in a, in a certain nation you were born into as part of your identity. Your identity also is can, built up of your sex, your gender. Like you were created as, as that as a part of your identity. Also, on top of that, your family of origin, like your family you were born into. I realize there are um, accidental parents, but there are no accidental kids. You understand that? I mean, sometimes parents are like, whoops, but there are no whoops when it comes to kids. You know your age, your relationships you have, they're all part of your identity, your occupation, what you're good at, your gifts, your possessions, all these things, your personality, your character, all part of your identity. But can I tell you, all of those things help build your identity, but none of those things are your primary identity. Your primary identity is this, that you are a child of God, that you're made in the image of God, that you are known by God. In other words, he knows you. Even if you don't know him, he knows you. You are found in Christ and you are loved with an unconditional love. This builds your primary identity. And your primary identity informs you of who you are and how you are to live. So you need to know who you are. Well, I'm a human, but I've, I've been created by divine design. But also, to whom do I belong? Well, I belong to a creator God. And you know what? I also belong to those that he has created. In other words, I am an individual, but I'm also interrelated with other individuals. You see, in other words, God owns you. God owns you. For those of you that are Bears fans, Aaron Rodgers does not own you. Aaron Rodgers does not own you, okay? I don't care what he says, okay? Some of you get that. Some of you football fans will understand that. <laughs> God owns you. In all the right ways. In fact, it says in Psalm 100, know that the Lord, he is God, and he, it is he who made us, and we are whose? His. We're his. Not only are we owned by God, but guess what? We are interrelated with other people. We're interrelated. In other words, those other people help me understand who God made me to be. A relationship with Jesus is personal. Okay, it's a personal thing, but get this, it's strengthened in a community of faith, otherwise known as a church. And that's why I hear a lot lately in the last decade, people are like, well, I love Jesus, but I don't go to church. And I'm like, that's awesome, but you're self-deceived. I, I told you I was going to shoot straight today, okay? Not only is it not theologically correct, but on top of that, you will never understand your God-given identity living in isolation. 
So therefore, you have to be formed within a community of faith as well as personally through the word of God and through your relationship with Jesus. It's both and. It's not one or the other. So if you're not in church, get involved in church, all right? Because here's the reason why. It's, it helps you understand who God made you to be. In fact, we have this thing called Growth Track, and, and it starts the first Sunday of every single month. We push it all the time because part of Growth Track is we help you understand not only your gifts, but your purpose and how God created you to be. So, so listen, that all is within the context of the church as well as personally. So we're in this series called Stranger Things, like I said. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you're like, how does any of this identity stuff, how does this relate to the Holy Spirit at all? Well, this is how I believe that uh, it does. That we are needing to know what the Holy Spirit says about our identity. And in fact, without the Holy Spirit's help, I put down here, you will not understand your true identity and you will spend a lifetime pursuing counterfeit identities. Ones that temporarily satisfy your questions, but fall short of bringing lasting answers. And that is why we need the Holy Spirit. That's why I'm finishing up this series on the Holy Spirit. Because I believe, and this is my prayer for each and every one of us today, I'm asking the Holy Spirit gives you supernatural revelation of who you are in Christ. That's what I'm praying at the end of the day. I want the Holy Spirit to give you supernatural revelation because there's a lot of counterfeit identities out there. And when we ask the question, like, you know, we're standing outside in the middle of the night looking up at the black sky and we're like, who am I? Well, I'll tell you what, money answers, I will give you worth. Money says, you know what? I'll make you somebody. I'll make you important. It's a counterfeit identity accomplishments say, I'll get you noticed. We'll get you noticed. You, you do certain things. You achieve certain things. You get certain plaques on the wall. You get enough degrees. You do all these things. And again, none of that's bad, all right? I'm, I mean, I'm trying to get more degrees myself, so there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But that doesn't build who I am. My degrees, my accomplishments, my awards, all those things, those don't inform me of who I am. Those are not my primary identification marks. Relationships will say, you know what? She'll complete you or he'll complete you. Sex says, um, I'll fulfill you. Vices say, we'll make you better. We'll make you braver. <laughs> Fame says, I'll make you happy. See, all these things, we try to find our identity sometimes in these things. I'll find my identity in being the party animal on Fridays. I'll, I'll find my identity on being the, the best employee at the company, and I'll make my way all the way to the top. I'll find my identity in finding the right relationship. We, we try to get these counterfeit identities, but Michael Horton uh, wrote this one time, and I, I just think this is super, super powerful. He said, Re receiving one's identity from one's God through a story that one hears is different from determining one's own identity through idols that the worshiper has created and therefore controls. Wow. See, all those other identities, those counterfeit identities, all of them, all of them to some degree we control. And so we're trying to find our identity out of something that we put on a platform or, or, or something to worship, but yet we still control it. And it just does not work. It does not work. Paul wrote this, and he said this to the church of Ephesus. I think this is interesting. He says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Okay, here I am. I'm connecting all the dots, all right? The Holy Spirit empowers you. Okay, Paul, empowers you to do what, okay? Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand. So therefore, the Holy Spirit gives us the power to understand, all right? The power to get it, in other words, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. In other words, without the Holy Spirit, we don't understand God's divine love and his divine design. We don't get it without the Holy Spirit. 
May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great, to understand fully, then you will be able to be made complete with all the fullness of life. You want a full life and the power that comes from God. It all comes from the Holy Spirit awakening us, supernaturally helping us understand God's love for us, and therefore, out of love, we understand identity. In fact, I would even say this. If there's no such thing as divine love, there's no such thing as finding our identity. It all has to come out of love because divine love informs us of our worth and our value and our identity. Here's a flawed metaphor because it's flawed because I'm, I'm using myself as the metaphor here. Um, as a parent, and there are no perfect parents, there's only one perfect Heavenly Father, God himself. But I think of my three kids. I think of Caden and Connor and Paxton. And I think about each of them, and if I were to, um, in a sense, say that they are my children, but only contractually, only legally. See, see here's the thing. When, um, when Jen got pregnant um, and gave birth to all three of our kids, our three boys are, in some ways, made in our image, all right? Made in our image. They kind of look like us. They kind of act a little bit like us, okay? All right? But imagine as if a father, all I said is, well, you're contractually my kid, but I'm never going to show you love. I'm never going to show you care. And I'm never going to provide for you. Guess what? My kids would have some head games. Right? And some of us, unfortunately, as I'm talking about that, some of you are going, well, that's actually my story. I grew up in a home where my dad was absolutely absent, and so therefore, I never saw love, I never saw care, and I never saw provision for my father. And if you were honest, you'd probably say that that's given you some head games. You've had to work through it. In fact, we have a, a, a term for that. It's kind of a slang term for that in our culture, that if someone grows up with an absent father, that they can have daddy issues, right? Daddy issues. That, that's when people, if they haven't worked through that, if they haven't worked through that, that, that guess what? They live a life compensating for an absent father. And, and, and it's real. And that's why I think the enemy's number one attack on our lives is not drug abuse or robbing a bank or lying or cheating or murder, although those are obviously temptations to some people and those are real sins, I don't think that's his nuclear weapon. I think his nuclear weapon is this. Make you feel like the Heavenly Father is absent and have you question what God really said about you. And you're like, really? Yeah, go way back to Adam and Eve, way back to the very beginning. Did Satan come along as the serpent and say, hey, go murder somebody? No. Did he say, go rob a bank? No. Go lie? No. What did he tempt Adam and Eve to do? He said this. He said, oh yeah, I know God told you you weren't supposed to eat that one tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But what did he do? He said, did God really say? See, that's the number one nuclear weapon of the enemy. He always makes us question God, his love, his loyalty, his care, and his presence. That is what he does. He always is doing that. And you know what it's doing? It's giving us head games. And what we do is when we buy into that kind of a lie, we begin to not understand our identity because we're separated from our creator and we start looking to all these counterfeit identities to give us knowledge of who we are. Spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, ladies and gentlemen, we all got daddy issues because of sin. And we are compensating by going and chasing things or people to either inform us or tell us who we really are rather than be connected to the perfect heavenly father who is never absent, who is always with us, who gives us our God-given identities. You know, I've even talked to people this week that um, have gone through some difficult things 
Because as humans, to be human is really to experience sorrow and suffering and disappointment in this life. It's really true. I mean, in fact, all of us have experienced those three things. For a human, we've experienced it because we live in a hopelessly broken world. It's not the way God designed the world. It's the way our sin has polluted this world. And so when we experience hardship, we begin to hear the enemy's voice. Did God really say? So this week I even was talking to somebody who had a very um, disappointing diagnosis. This person has loved Jesus their whole life. They would tell you they know that Jesus loves them, but now there's a diagnosis and now they're having questions because the enemy comes in and starts whispering things. Did God really say that he loves you? Did God really say he'd heal you? Did God really say he's with you? Did God really say he cares for you? See, because of that, we begin to have identity issues. And we need to remember the love of God. Jesus actually said this in John 16. He said, but the time is coming, and indeed it is here now. He's talking to his disciples. When you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. This is right before the cross. In other words, he's looking at his disciples. He's like, hey, listen, you guys are all going to bail on me. You're going to run for your lives. I'm going to be left all alone. But listen to what Jesus says. Yet... I am not alone. Why? Why does he know he's not alone? Because he goes on to say, because the Father is with me. He knew his identity. He knew he was a son to the Father. And even though there was hardship and suffering and sorrow and disappointment, that didn't disconnect him from the Father. It just meant that he's living in a hopelessly broken world. And he goes on to say, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Being a Christian doesn't give you a get out of jail card when it comes to sorrow and suffering. Being a Christian means you are no longer alone. You are owned. You are his. Jesus has overcome all of that. And I realize on this side of eternity, we're going to experience a lot of pain and disappointment. But someday, ladies and gentlemen, we don't preach enough about heaven. Someday, we are going to be in a place where there's unspeakable joy and rest. This is temporary. This is temporary. This is temporary. And Jesus knew that. But if you are not careful, when you go through hardship, you'll start to have an identity crisis. And wonder if God really said. But I want to remind you as we close today. That guess what? Your primary identity is that you are a child of God. And that you are made in the image of God. You are known by God. You are found in Christ and you are loved. And some of us today have forgotten that. And in the last three minutes that I have with you, I want to read a verse out of Romans chapter 8. And I want this verse to go deep into your soul, whether you're watching in your living room or at God behind bars right now or here in this auditorium or some other auditorium. I want you to listen to this because you don't have to chase the counterfeit identities anymore. You are God's. He loves you. He created you. He is with you. And Paul writes to the Romans, he says this, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Did it mean he no longer loves us? Listen, if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death, as the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day, we are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And then he goes on to say this, and I'm telling you, I get fired up when I read this every time. I am convinced, he said, that nothing, everybody say the word nothing on the count of three. One, two, three. Nothing. One more time and say it like you mean it. One, two, three. Nothing, nothing can ever separate us us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, nor even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love, nor 
power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Paul is saying, your identity is in the fact that you are a child of God. And come hell or high water, good times, bad times, it doesn't matter. You're a child of God. He is with you. You are purposed. You are created on purpose. You are significant. You are important. You are special. You are His. And He loves you no matter what you're going through. See, your power, your superpower is not in self-help. Your superpower is not in being true to yourself or finding yourself or following your heart. Guess what your superpower is in? Your superpower is understanding that the Holy Spirit is going to give you an understanding of God's meteoric love for you, which informs you of who you are and to whom you belong. The Holy Spirit gives you revelation of God's love that's more powerful than anything you're going through. So yes, you are important. Why? Not because of anything you can do. It is because the Creator said so. You are special. Not because your fingerprint is different than anybody else's, but because God said you're special. You are His. And you are deeply loved. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to pray for you. Lord, I pray right now, a supernatural, Holy Spirit-breathed revelation of divine love for each and every person that is here. There are people in this room that have been told they're nothing, they're failures, they're rejects. They've been told they're less than. They've been told they're less important than others that they'll never be successful. They've been having all kinds of things spoken over them. But I pray today that your Holy Spirit would speak into their heart and may they know they are created. They are designed. They are loved. They're significant. They're important. They are on mission for you. That they have a purpose that is stronger than any hellish attack. And most of all, may they realize that they are owned by you. In other words, they are yours. Purchased with a great price. So Lord, thank you. May that be a revelation. Before I say amen, I do believe there's people in the room, and just every head bowed, there's people in the room or in other rooms, maybe in your living room, you're hearing about divine love for the very first time, and you're going, I want that. You can become a person that has a relationship with God today. It's not joining a church. It's not joining a denomination. It has nothing to do with that. It's basically saying, Jesus, I believe you died for me. You care for me. You created me. I want to ask forgiveness for all the the wrong I've done, and I want you to be the leader and the forgiver of my life. And if that's you, I want you to just pray this prayer after me. In fact, we're all going to pray it together. But as you pray it, God is listening to you. He created you. So let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, I come to you today and I ask for forgiveness for all my sin. Come into my life. Thank you for your meteoric love that is unconditional. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for making me special. Thank you for giving me importance. I want you to be the leader of my life in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Come on, put your hands together for a great God, huh?